You may have heard of Machine Gun Kelly through his crazy antics on stage, his legendary feud with Eminem, or his new engagement to Megan Fox. Or more recently, if you're like me and you've been on TikTok, it's for his absolutely tone deaf covers of Paramore and Linkin Park. But as he has continued to grow his career as both a musician and actor, it hasn't been without concerns and controversies. From blaming a security guard for getting in the way of a bottle during a fight to calling young underage girls hot, it seems there's no end to his outlandish hot takes. So who is Machine Gun Kelly? Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be talking about Machine Gun Kelly and a little bit of the music industry as a whole. Now, recently Machine Gun Kelly and his relationship with actress Megan Fox has made some headlines and their bizarre relationship has led them to become one of the most interesting aspects of Hollywood gossip currently. After their engagement, Megan Fox posted on Instagram that the couple had drank each other's blood following the engagement. They've also called their relationship demonic and Megan gave MGK a vial of her blood to wear around his neck. Their engagement is one of the most talked about events of the year. But while their, let's say, interesting relationship dynamic seems to be everywhere, people don't seem to know how exactly we got here. How did Machine Gun Kelly suddenly become one of the most talked about celebrities in the world? What's with his bizarre antics? Why does the industry seem to avoid his consistent comments on underage girls and seemingly continuous string of lawsuits? Well, let's find out and dive a little deeper. Machine Gun Kelly, whose real name is Colson Baker, was born in Houston, Texas, but his parents moved around often, and according to him, he lived in over a dozen places in his childhood. He describes his father as a super Christian, and his traveling lifestyle in his childhood can be largely attributed to his father being a missionary. According to MGK, his mother left the family when he was only nine years old, and he doesn't have a relationship with her. He says his life growing up with his father was difficult. While they lived in Denver with his aunt, his father fought both depression and unemployment. According to a First Avenue article written about his background and experiences when he was younger, he split his time between wearing two school outfits and being bullied by the neighborhood kids. After years of enduring bullying, MGK says he used his words to fight back. It was inspired by DMX's We Right Here and began using rap as an outlet to express how he was feeling. But according to him, he also had multiple instances of getting in trouble with the law at a young age. He says he faced felony charges when he was 14 years old for unspecified crimes, though according to Rolling Stone, he does have a song that suggests he shot up a car in a jealous rage. While speaking with a Rolling Stone reporter, MGK told them, I will never forget my dad's face when I was in that courtroom. I was chained to like eight other homies too. Not my homies, just random dudes. There's not really much information on this part of his life or what happened with the supposed felony charges, so we're just gonna move on. Unfortunately, life seemed to keep throwing curveballs at MGK, and when he was in high school, his father left and moved to Kuwait, leaving the young MGK behind to live in a neighbor's basement. He says that this is when he began to experiment with drugs and getting into more trouble. This is also the same time that he would record his first demo. When describing this time in his life, he says, it was terrible, but I thought it was cool. Then, as just a freshman in high school, he stopped going to school. But soon, his father moved him to Kuwait, where according to First Avenue, he got into even more trouble, though they don't specify what kind of trouble exactly. Eventually, MGK and his father moved back to the United States and finally settled in Cleveland, Ohio, where he now proudly claims to be his home. This is where his career truly began to grow. There, he got his first manager and began growing a fan base in Cleveland. He claims that his fan base were actually the ones that gave him the name because of his rapid fire delivery. Then in 2009, he got the chance to go to the famous Apollo Theater in New York to perform in a talent show. He told First Avenue, "'We drove straight from Ohio and stood in line for 10 hours. I got booed as soon as I walked on the Apollo stage.'" But the booing didn't seem to phase the young Machine Gun Kelly as he became the first rapper in the Apollo talent show's history to win, not just once, but twice. From there, the music industry began to take notice and he was awarded best Midwest artist in 2010 at the Underground Music Awards. And his song and music video, Alice in Wonderland, won best music video that same year at Ohio Hip Hop Awards. All of this was happening months after his dad had kicked him out of the house. He had his first child at 18 and was working at Chipotle to pay the bills. But only one year later, all of his work seemed to finally pay off. In 2011, he was signed by Interscope Records and the very same year he won MTV's hottest breakthrough MC. From this point on, Machine Gun Kelly's career has only grown. 
He has starred in multiple movies, won a variety of awards, and has become a relatively household name in the music industry and beyond. But his success has not come without some controversy or hardships. He has been extremely open about his struggles with addiction and even told Rolling Stone magazine that he was shocked that he beat the curse of 27. This refers to multiple famous musicians like Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, and Amy Winehouse who died when they were 27 years old, usually for either drug addiction or suicide. But as he pointed out, trouble just seems to keep finding him. He has dealt with various lawsuits in his career and raised quite a few eyebrows with his multiple comments about underage girls. So what's going on with Machine Gun Kelly? In 2012, Machine Gun Kelly was reportedly in a massive bar fight with people in Florida. When asked about the incident by Rolling Stone, he told them, I put my hands on a 400 pound bouncer whose job is to whoop people's asses like mine and he sued me for $2 million. Well, that's not exactly what happened, at least not according to the bouncer or the lawsuit. According to William Long, the security guard involved, Machine Gun Kelly either threw or used a liquor bottle as a weapon against him. William Long claimed that Machine Gun Kelly sliced his finger with the bottle, which led him to spend eight days in the hospital and have two separate surgeries. In response, Mr. Long filed a lawsuit against MGK. While he does admit to throwing the bottle, he claims that he did not intend the bottle to hit any person in particular and that the bottle actually hit the DJ and not the security guard, William Long. I'm not uh, personally understanding how that makes the situation any better, but okay. MGK pointed out during the legal battle that Mr. Long had admitted to being hit with bottles before during his 35 year career as a security guard and alluded that it was Mr. Long's fault that he was hit by a bottle because he should have known not to intervene. But after two years of litigation with the trial set for November, 2014, the two parties decided they would settle the lawsuit to avoid a trial. I could not find exact specifications of the lawsuit settlement, but the two decided on a confidential agreement. Only one month later, the Jasmine brand reported that Machine Gun Kelly found himself back in court again for the same incident after William Long accused him of fraud. According to court documents, Mr. Long accused Machine Gun Kelly of acting falsely, fraudulently, willfully, and in bad faith when he verbally agreed to the original settlement. Mr. Long claimed that Machine Gun Kelly had no intention of actually signing the settlement agreement and merely suggested it in hopes to delay the trial. Following the complaint, the judge ordered Machine Gun Kelly to appear for a trial date in December. Unfortunately, I could not find any follow-up details on the case, but given that he claimed the security guard sued him for $2 million, I would think he actually had to pay some sort of settlement. Regardless of the final results, this was not the only thing that happened with Machine Gun Kelly in 2014. That same year, Machine Gun Kelly would hold his first EST Fest. EST stands for Everyone Stands Together, and the three-day festival had seven stages and musicians and DJs from a variety of genres. The event brought in anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 fans, depending on who you ask, and was by most accounts a massive success. In fact, it was considered to be so successful that Machine Gun Kelly continues to hold the festival in Cleveland every year. However, the event wasn't a success for everyone. In a 2015 Cleve Scene article, they described the horrific experiences of people who worked the event and spent the next year trying to gain the money they were owed for their labor. The story follows two workers in particular, Elizabeth Russell and Jeff Walters, who worked as staging techs at the festival. In the beginning, they were told they would earn $1,800 for working nine days on the site, which $1,800 for nine days doesn't seem that bad. That is, if they actually got paid. According to Cleve Scene, rumors were spreading around the festival crew only two days into setting up that no one was going to be paid and that something was up with the money. Apparently they claimed this isn't entirely uncommon for independent music festivals. Sometimes things happen and the money comes in late, but at least usually the money comes in. Unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't, as we saw with Fire Festival, which we've talked about previously. But despite the rumors, Russell and Walters continued to do their work, convinced that even if their paycheck was a little late, it would come eventually. However, before that could even become a concern, they were first required to live on the grounds of the festival for nine days. They stayed in the woods during the event and traded 24 seven shifts to monitor the dome and the equipment. Russell says the work became so exhausting that they barely had time to sleep or eat and told Clevesine that it got to the point where it was like, is this even worth it? I feel it wasn't. I feel we got fucked, excuse my French. Then at the end of the event, their pay was due on August 3rd, 2014, but it didn't come. Not only did Russell and Walters not get paid, but the techs, the electrical team, the equipment providers, the venue also never got the money they were owed. No one seemed to know what was going on, where their money was, or even who was supposed to be paying them. Their invoices seemed to be lost, and somehow they weren't even sure who was officially in charge of the festival. 
A few weeks later, all of those involved with the event production were told they needed to send invoices to Live In Legends LLC, a group they'd never heard of before. Live In LLC was a promotions team for Machine Gun Kelly and was widely responsible for his touring success. Despite this, as the weeks continued to go by, the lawsuit started to roll in. The park where the event was held even sued Living Legends LLC for breach of contract after failure to pay the park's event fee. But despite the continued effort by the crew and the managers of the festival to recoup money and settlements that they were owed for days of grueling work at a festival that took an estimated $300,000 as of 2015, no one got paid. I couldn't find any updates to the situation, but hopefully people eventually got their money. If not, it is curious how the situation wasn't a bigger deal. I could only find one article describing the lawsuits and stories of the unpaid employees. I find this to be kind of curious, but anyway, this is not the first or last time Machine Gun Kelly has found his name connected with lawsuits. Granted, this one is not entirely his fault, but the festival is still tied with his name all the same. Even so, he faced two more lawsuits in 2019 and 2021, one of them coming from his own business partner. In 2019, it was reported that James McMillan, Machine Gun Kelly's business partner and an entertainment lawyer, was suing him for breach of contract for allegedly refusing to participate in a merchandise agreement and breaking an exclusivity agreement with McMillan. McMillan and MGK started Est 19XX LLC, an entertainment company together in 2011 after McMillan helped to establish the deal between MGK and Interscope Records the same year. But according to the lawsuit, MGK began to do business with a different company called MGK Media Group LLC, breaking the exclusivity agreement he held with Macmillan. Additionally, the lawsuit claims that MGK's refusal to participate in a merchandising deal could cost EST19XX to lose $800,000. So far, there have not been any updates to the lawsuit and Machine Gun Kelly and his team have refused to comment. So we'll see what happens here. Now, as for 2021, MGK found himself in yet another legal battle, but this time for elder abuse, assault, and battery. John Tilly, a disabled parking lot attendant in Los Angeles, filed a complaint against Machine Gun Kelly for allegedly pushing and threatening him at Studio City along with a group of his friends. The lawsuit described Tilly as a 49-year-old veteran with a disability limitation and a sensitive, soft-spoken, gentle, quiet person. It claims that the altercation with MGK began when Tilly learned that he and his friends who were filming in the bank's parking lot did not have permission to be there. Upon learning this, he asked him and his friends to leave multiple times. Then according to Tilly, after asking them to leave the premises repeatedly, MGK pushed him and began yelling threats. After the incident, Tilly claims that he tried to serve MGK with the lawsuit an astonishing 19 times. And when he was unable to do so, he eventually published the complaint in the Los Angeles Daily Journal in an attempt to get his attention. However, when the deadline came for MGK to respond to the lawsuit, he had it. Why? Well, he blames the presence of fake news stories about him in the media. In a court filing from MGK's lawyer obtained by Rolling Stone, he asked the judge to set aside the default of the claim and allow MGK to fight it, arguing that MGK missed the deadlines by accident. A sworn statement said, "'As a result of my profession, there are many stories, accounts, reports, and other write-ups citing my name, state Machine Gun Kelly, that purport to describe activities in which I have been involved. When I followed them regularly, I found that many of the publications ranged from false to only partially true. These publications occur sometimes multiple times each day. As a result, I no longer make it common practice to read publications about me or those that cite to my entertainment name, Machine Gun Kelly, to determine whether or not something therein is truthful, newsworthy, or should place me on notice. Regardless of the reasoning, MGK claims he didn't even notice the lawsuit until after the date for him to respond had already passed. Then he got himself a lawyer and of course, adamantly denies the allegations against him. This excuse seemed to work though, as he was eventually granted the extension to gather his legal team and fight the lawsuit instead of it going to default. For now, this lawsuit is currently pending, so we don't have any updates to give you. But once again, I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens. While MGK seems to have a plethora of legal issues, whether directly or indirectly involving him, perhaps the biggest stain on his career and most widespread criticism has come from his continuous inappropriate comments about minors. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and place the sponsors for today's episode here, because this is just a fair warning. We're gonna talk about him sexualizing minors and the comments and things he's tweeted and said about people under the age of 18, and it's gross. So if you're not in the the right headspace to hear about this, this is your warning. Sponsor segments about what, two and a half, three minutes long. This is your warning. If you're here after that, you know exactly what we're gonna talk about. So that's your heads up. For many people, getting financially healthy means dropping the weight of credit card debt. But where do you start when it feels like a never ending cycle? 
If you have multiple credit card balances every single month and are only paying the minimums, you're barely making a dent in your credit card debt, which can be really discouraging. Upstart can help you pay off your existing debt quickly so you can finally feel like you're getting ahead. And it's not just credit cards. If you're consolidating high interest debts, funding a personal expense, maybe using it to start up a new business, over a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment with a very clear payoff date. And Upstart knows you're more than just your credit score. So rather than just looking at your score alone, Upstart models can look at other factors like your income, employment, and other information that you provide in your loan application to find you a smarter rate for the loan that you need. And you can check your rate online without impacting your credit score in just five minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash casket. That's upstart.com slash casket. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know that we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit score, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Today's episode is also sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. I love being able to shop online while in my PJs, but I'm terrible at keeping track of promo codes and who has time for that? But now I have Honey to help find those precious money-saving codes for me. Honey is the free shopping tool that searches the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones to your cart. Now, recently I've been reducing how much I've been buying online. I've been really trying to hold back and just kind of keep it local a little bit. I don't know, I'm just trying a new thing for right now. It's a new year's resolution. It's probably gonna fail, but I'm trying anyway. But I've used Honey to help purchase furniture for the house when I needed a new rug from a furniture store. It's even helped me buy some supplies for the candle making business and of course clothing. So they're literally everywhere. And now Honey just doesn't work on your desktop alone. It also works on your iPhone. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on amazing savings. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And I'd never recommend something I don't use. And I've been using Honey for years. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash casket. That's joinhoney.com slash casket. Now, given the topic we're about to discuss, some instances of inappropriate comments towards underage girls and the sexual assault of minors, if this is a little too much for you, again, last warning, just feel free to just kind of skip the rest of this episode if we're being honest. With that being said, let's get into it. Now, before I get into the multiple instances that Machine Gun Kelly has made inappropriate and frankly, extremely concerning and disgusting comments about minors, I want to talk about the music industry as a whole. Unfortunately, there has been a longstanding pattern of the music industry and people within it, either supporting relationships between adult men and minor girls, ignoring these relationships, or honestly, just even promoting them in music. We have seen plenty of times how this can lead to dangerous situations for these young girls. The rock industry has a long history of music and even relationships that involve older men and younger girls dating all the way back to the 1930s. For example, the Rolling Stones had a lyric in one of their songs that said, I don't care that you're 15 years old, I don't wanna see no ID. Ugh, gross. Another example dates all the way back to 1937 from Sonny Boy Williamson, a Mississippi blues duo. Those lyrics said, good morning, little schoolgirls, can I come home with you? Tell your mama and your papa, I'm a little schoolboy too. Double gross. What makes that one even worse is that it was repeatedly played by multiple music legends, including Chuck Berry, who served two years in prison for driving a minor across state lines when he was 33, Huey Lewis and Paul Rogers too. As if the lyrics aren't bad enough, older men dating and even marrying young minor girls, and again, I'm saying girls, not women, have been alarmingly common in the music industry. One of the most famous examples of this came from Elvis Presley. Elvis allegedly had a longstanding history of dating girls while they were still minors. Then when he was 24 years old, he began dating Priscilla Beaulieu, who was only 14 at the time. Despite the 10 year difference, no one seemed to bat an eye. Two years later, when she was only 16 years old, they moved in together. They would later marry after she finally turned 18. In an interview with Barbara Walters, Priscilla said, "'I can only go back to his concept of what he wanted in a woman. Somewhere in the past, he wanted a virgin." Now, there's a lot that can be said by this comment itself, but the fact that an extremely famous 24-year-old dated a 14-year-old without any backlash or concern whatsoever is just shocking. What makes it worse is that this was not his first time doing this. And as I said, he dated minor girls before without any concern from the music industry. Another famous example comes from the bassist for Rolling Stones, Bill Wyman, who famously began dating Mandy Smith when she was only 13 years old. According to various tabloids and articles that reported on the relationship at the time, Smith's parents approved of the relationship. Instead of questioning it, tabloids in the UK instead called Smith the original wild child. 
Years later, when Smith turned 18, the pair got married, but they separated only two years later. When asked about the marriage in an interview with the Daily Mail in 2010, Smith said she regretted the past saying, you can never get that part of your life, your childhood back, I never could. She went on to say, some girls aren't even ready then. If it happened today, Wyman would be absolutely vilified by the press, he'd be in jail. Of course, one of the most recent examples of the music industry willfully ignoring a star's predatory behavior is that of R. Kelly. Now, clearly I don't have the time to go over every single detail of the R. Kelly saga, If you'd like me, let me know, and maybe I'll consider it, though it is quite gross and horrific. But R. Kelly's history with underage girls is extensive, and the history of the music industry ignoring it is just as convoluted and disastrous. Sadly, these are just a few of the most famous instances of musicians engaging in predatory behavior and relationships with underage girls. There are many others. And this is why it's so concerning to see and hear about the multiple concerning comments that Machine Gun Kelly has made. But even more difficult to grapple with is that a lot of the music industry is indifferent towards the statements he's made. While Machine Gun Kelly hasn't committed the atrocious acts like R. Kelly or anyone we've mentioned previously, it's important to remember that a lot of those acts started out as gross comments that everyone just ignored. And that's why it's so important to not keep letting this slide. Machine Gun Kelly has been making wildly inappropriate and deeply awful comments related to underage girls even before he gained his record deal with Interscope Records in 2011. But recently, the folks on TikTok and beyond have begun to take notice and collect the receipts of his comments. One of the first came in 2010 when he tweeted that he felt like a creeper. The full tweet reads, "'I wish 13, 14, 15 year old girls weren't allowed to be so hot, so I wouldn't feel like such a creeper when I look at them. I'm just 19, hashtag I'm just saying.'" Then in 2013, during an interview, he discussed having a crush on Kendall Jenner, who was only 17 at the time. The interviewer asked if he was counting down the days until she was 18, which is already incredibly weird to say. But then his response made the situation even worse. He responded to the question by saying he was not waiting until she was 18 since he was 23 and he felt like it wasn't a creepy age. As if that wasn't bad enough, he went on to add that apparently since she's a celebrity, there's no limits right there. This is a whole other conversation about how society looks at girls who are celebrities as being older or having no limits. We have seen the same type of rhetoric used to explain inappropriate comments about Millie Bobby Brown and Billie Eilish who have both recently turned 18. But like I said, it's a whole other conversation. All I'll say is someone being a celebrity does not magically make them older and saying so is worrisome at least. But as if that wasn't bad already, he decided to continue on and say, I don't care, say what you want, man. If Kendall Jenner is in your bedroom naked and you're 50, you're you're going." going. He continued in the interview to explain why he felt this was perfectly acceptable. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to discuss the music industry's history of allowing and accepting inappropriate relationships between underage girls and grown men because of the exact excuse he used. He said, Robert Plant, who was one of the greatest lead singers ever, dated a girl that was 14. Axl Rose, who was one of the biggest badasses ever, dated a girl that was 16. I don't care, say what you want, man. Of course, when this video resurfaced on TikTok, multiple people reacted by saying it was repulsive among other things. Honestly, I can't say I disagree with them. This type of language is repulsive. And the fact that he had facts waiting to explain why it was okay makes it so much worse. He thought through this justification of wanting to fuck someone who was underage. Then of course, there is the infamous feud between him and the rap god himself, Eminem, which allegedly started after Machine Gun Kelly made inappropriate comments about Eminem's daughter, Haley, on Twitter. In 2012, when MGK was 21 years old, Haley was 15 and he posted a tweet that said this. Okay, so I just saw a picture of Eminem's daughter and I have to say, she is hot as fuck in the most respectful way possible cause M is king. Following this tweet, a pretty epic feud occurred between Eminem and MGK that resulted in multiple songs released over the years. However, years later, MGK claimed on The Breakfast Club that when he posted the tweet, he didn't know how old she was and was simply reacting to how this person that we had known through records has grown up. And I know a lot of people who grew up listening to Eminem were very aware of who Haley was and roughly how old she was at the time too. But reacting to how she's grown up does not mean making creepy comments on her physical appearance when she was only 15 years old. And while there are some fan theories that suggest that the feud between the two was actually made up or staged for publicity purposes, that does not excuse the use of the inappropriate and crude language directed towards a 15 year old girl from a 21 year old. All I can say on that is thank God Eminem delivered the kill shot. Now over the years, Machine Gun Kelly's language has definitely raised some red flags for music fans. 
However, some of his fans seem to think that he has only made one of these comments and that it's just no big deal. Regardless, it doesn't seem to have an extreme impact on his career as he continues to grow and release new music. And while maybe he's comfortable with being the little trash gremlin that ran away from rap music, did some pop punk, and then now claims he's gonna go back and do rap music and has nothing to do with being bullied out of the pop punk scene, allegedly, I don't know. It's just funny to watch him run from genre to genre personally, like with his tail tucked between his legs, but that's a, <laughs> that's a different thing entirely. I think the most disappointing thing out of all of this, honestly, is I personally really liked Megan Fox and to see that she's like, okay with this type of person, it just, it just makes me like really disappointed in her. Like sometimes certain people are just garbage and that's the end of the story, right? But then it's like, but, but you were so awesome. Why would you date the trash? And, and that's just kind of what it feels like. And you know, damn, that sucks. If she's happy, I guess good for her, but I would not be happy dating someone who thinks that 13, 14 and 15 year old girls are hot and sexy, but that's just me, I guess. But with all of that being said, that's a whole ton of my opinions. And that's where we're ending today's episode. I hope you learned something new today, although I I most certainly hope you did not enjoy this episode because it's gross. Um, But I did hope you learned something new today about Machine Gun Kelly. If you did, make sure you're liking, following and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I appreciate you spending some of your time here today and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye. 